you. I hope you had a nice break. I thought the morning session was certainly stimulating. I look forward to another equally stimulating conversation now. This session we call extreme conservation. It was suggested and touched on lightly in the previous session. Now we're going to dive into it much more aggressively. This is an exciting panel full of rock stars who are literally on the front lines. Uh, you heard in the previous panel about some of the laws uh, that protect wildlife, but what happens when things get pushed to the edge? Who steps in? Our topic today is extreme conservation. What I'm going to do is uh, provide a brief bio of each of our panelists, and then they'll step forward and make presentations, and then we'll quickly open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, one, th one thing that we're going to do is if we have time, uh, we will keep going after the 12 o'clock hour if some of you want to stay and continue to ask questions. So first up today we have Ian Singleton, the gentleman on my right, uh, with the Pan Echo Foundation and Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program. Uh, Dr. Singleton is an experienced former zookeeper having worked with a variety of different species at Whipsnade and Edinburgh zoos. Uh, before specializing in orangutans after moving to the Jersey Zoo in 1989, he visited Indonesia several times over the years to learn more about wild orangutans until he finally left Jersey in 1996 to begin a PhD study of them ranging from behavior in the peat swamp forest of Suak, Belimbing, in the Leisure Ecosystem and Ganung Leisure National Park on completion of his thesis, he joined the Swiss-based Pan Echo Foundation and Yayazin, Yayazin, Yayasin Ecosystem, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. With more than 23 years experience with orangutans, he currently keeps busy working to confiscate illegal uh, pet orangutans and return them to a life in the wild in field research and monitoring of the remaining wild Sumatran orangutan population and increasingly in the battle to protect their rainforest habitat. Let's hear it from Mr. Singleton. I, I thought I'd better put a map up here because we're in America. Um, but basically, <laughs> that's Indonesia there, the orange thing. And I work on Sumatra, which is the long, thin island on the left-hand side of Indonesia. Borneo is in the middle, uh, for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, the Sumatran orangutan, the species we, we work with, is confined to the northern end of the island. And I'll just point out, because we're so near Yellowstone, that Yellowstone is not the biggest volcanic eruption ever on planet Earth. It's this, uh, this lake here, Lake Toba, which was before Yellowstone and even bigger. Um, but anyway, the orangutans are confined to the north, uh, up here in what we call the Losa ecosystem block, and uh, a small population down in the Batang Toro is critically endangered, only several thousand remaining. And that's what a Sumatran orangutan looks like, much prettier than the Borneans. You see the long glowing golden beards and everything. So what's the problem? The main problem for orangutans in Indonesia generally, Sumatra especially, is just a whole scale destruction of landscapes by the palm oil industry. It's not just plantations here and there, it's a whole landscapes being chopped down. And nothing survives that process. You see, you go from a tropical rainforest with you know, untold biodiversity to this kind of situation where it's hard to find a grasshopper or a lizard. Uh, nothing survives that process. It's a complete annihilation of, of species. And the vast majority of orangutans end up like this. They're either deliberately killed uh, by people on the plantations or villages or they die of malnutrition and starvation. Um, so. uh, I think Emma mentioned this morning, uh, back, yeah. There have been, since 1970s, uh, probably at least 2,800 confiscations of illegal pet orangutans in Asia, in Sumatra and Borneo, of which I know of three prosecutions. Two in Borneo in 2010, and finally one in Sumatra in 2012. And this is a situation that seriously has to change if we're going to have any chance of saving these animals. And you'll see the fine, the punishment was just like eight months in prison, he was probably out in four, and seven million rupee, which is about, it's about 700 US. So it's not really much of an incentive. Um, I'm going to talk about the peat swamps a little bit, especially Tripa. But the peat swamps here on the, the west coast of Sumatra have the highest densities of orangutans in the world. 
compared to your average in Borneo, about one per square kilometer in the east side of here, maybe 1.5 or something like that, and over here as much as eight per square kilometer. So these peak swamps are the orangutan capital of the world by a long way. And I'm going to talk about Tripa, which is this particular area here. Now, Tripa in the early 90s was around 60,000 hectares and probably had at least uh, 3,000 orangutans living there in pristine uh, primary peat swamp forest. And then in the early 90s, uh, it was handed out to several, several palm oil concessions, uh, these big purple areas. Uh, and I'll just draw your attention to this little gap here which is of interest. But these were handed out in the 90s, and even though they're breaking the laws uh, left, right, and center, we would have very little chance of taking these guys to court because the permits have been there for so long. But they, they, they cleared areas of land before the civil conflict. Aceh province had a civil conflict for independence for many years. They cleared lots of land. Some of it they planted, some of it they didn't. And then during the conflict, they were all abandoned. And then after the tsunami and the peace deal in Aceh, uh, they started to resume operations again. Now, in 2010, the Norwegian government pledged $1 billion to the Indonesian government to develop uh, programs to reduce its carbon emissions from deforestation. And part of that deal was that Indonesia produced a map, a moratorium map, they call it, of areas where they will not grant new concessions uh, on primary forests or peatlands for at least the next couple of years. And that was recently renewed. But within that map was this area here. It's off limits. It's pink. And yet... In August 2011, after the map was produced, the government, the local government, uh, released this uh, uh, new permit for a palm oil plantation. And we sat down around, around the table and sort of said, you know, what do we do? We know it's illegal. It's, uh, it's off limits on here. It's also in the Loser ecosystem, which is a, a national strategic area for environmental protection. And we, we sat around the table and said, shall we challenge it? We said, yes. So we, we worked with a couple of local NGOs and we worked with a local community and filed two legal uh, processes against this concession. And then we started to really look at the data, and we went back and said, well, you know, what did it used to look like, this area? And in 2006, it was still pristine peat swamp. And then in 2010, there was already some encroachment up there. And then in October 2010, the company was already spreading into there and digging this huge drainage canal and fires and everything else. Ten months before they got a permit. So they're obviously breaking the law. And then, just after we filed these legal cases against the, the plantation permit, uh, the companies, all of the companies, started to dramatically use fire to clear forest land, which again is illegal in peatlands that's more than three meters deep. So by this time, we were getting a lot of international attention. We, we put this out onto the Facebooks and websites, and we got a lot of press interest, we got a lot of TV interest, BBC, CNN, and that put pressure on the government to take an interest. And, we, we got international, you know, like the ambassadors, the U.S., the, the Danish, the Norwegian government to put pressure on the government as well. And that resulted in the Ministry of the Environment taking an interest and coming down and actually filing legal cases against these companies as well. Let me show you some of the scale. And we looked at the data as well and we tried to, you know, basically... We, we had people within the Indonesian government interested to take on these cases, especially the people who were responsible for the, the Norway billion dollars and the RED program. And we helped them by providing with their, all the data and information they needed. So we plotted all the fire data, and uh, we could see exactly which companies. It's not just one company breaking the law, but it's all of them. Uh, and they've been doing it for many, many years. And then in March, as I said, we got a lot of international media attention because... There were 98 fires in just nine days in this area here. And we're able to sort of plot exactly which fires were in which company concessions and which year and everything else. So the point of this is that we, you have a lot, an access to a lot of data now. And it's a question of whether you can get access to that data. You can measure it, you can quantify it, and you can display it and distribute it around the world 15 times before breakfast. And by doing that, you know, you're able to really put the pressure on the, on the government to enforce its own reg regulations and laws. Uh, this is what the area looked like just a c couple of months after the main fires. You can see this, this is the concession we challenged. And this is a uh, burn scars from the concession next door, uh, which is also in the, where all the, most of the 98 fires were. And 
it's not good enough just to sort of use information, take photographs from a plane, because then they just say, well, it's Photoshop, or how do we know that's Indonesia? It could be in Peru. So you've got to really back everything up with, with you know, evidence and get people on the ground, eyewitnesses. You've got to get uh, your... But you've got to really actually go up there and say, well, that fire there is in this particular spot, and this one is that hot spot, and everything else. And we got quite good at it, and we can now, you know, access the information to say exactly what was lost. But uh, we're able to say that within a certain time period, this yellow area was cleared, and then within another time period, this pink area was cleared, and these are all the fires that were there and everything else. So we basically put together an overwhelming amount of evidence against these companies, which was then picked up by the... Ministry of the Environment. We had help with NBC. We had a really good program with them that got uh, prime time uh, broadcast on uh, Rock Center with Brian Williams, which was extremely useful to the cause. And the legal cases, throughout all this, the legal cases were going on, and the pressure was continuous against the government with petitions and everything else. And we won. We basically, the, the challenge against the company in the, in the Aceh court was thrown out. The guy had obviously been, the judges had obviously been bought off. So we appealed that in the Medan court in the next province and won. They agreed it was an illegal concession. They instructed the governor to cancel the permit, which he did. Then the governor, uh, the company sued the governor, so we appealed, and, and they won. And then we appealed that, and it's gone to the Supreme Court. And in April this year, the Supreme Court has upheld this decision. So this, this permit is cancelled, and it's still cancelled. <laughs> but but what's more than that is that the Ministry of Environment is still going after this company for burning as well. So not only is the permit cancelled, but they're going after them for illegal activities uh, in destroying the state assets. And they're going after the company next door to that as well, which is a 14,000 hectare area. And we just had like a, a week or two ago, uh, uh, the, the Ministry of Environment has finally uh, charged the directors of this company as well. But these cases are ongoing. We expect uh, a decision ag in this one against Kalista Alam within the next month or so, and we'll be on Facebook and everything very soon about that. And uh, the SPS 2 one, the company next door, uh, will be probably longer than that, six, six months to a year. But these are ongoing cases. But the problem with this is that while you're in court doing all these legal battles, they're still chopping down the forest, they're still digging canals, and they're still orangutans being killed. This one was in the SPS 2 concession in February. So one of the important things is you need to adapt and change to new opportunities. And while we were doing all this work on TRIPA, we suddenly found out that the Aceh government was pushing through a new spatial plan. And we looked at this spatial plan, and it was devastating. This is a, a rather, you know, this is kind of the worst case scenario, but basically this is the forest now, and all this red is potentially available for clearance. It includes mining exploration areas. It also includes a lot of roads and other areas that will potentially be lost in the next few years if the spatial plan goes ahead. So potentially devastating. And we end up with a situation like that. Now this is important because not only are all the Sumatran orangutans in Sumatra up there in this area, but by far the biggest population of Sumatran elephants is up here and the tigers and the only population of Sumatran rhinos. So if this spatial plan goes ahead and we do end up with the scenario like we just had, we're, we're basically seeing the end of of the elephant, the tiger, and the orangutan, and the rhino, in probably the rhino within months, um, if this goes ahead. This, this is the last chance. And one of the most devastating things in this plan is the roads. Most of these roads are in the spatial plan, but they're already being cut. The spatial plan hasn't even been approved yet. They're already being cut, and this is, that's going to fragment one of the main orangutan populations into God knows how many pieces. And in a few years, if we're lucky, we'll still have one viable population in this block here. But the poten potential is to lose these, the sinkhill swamps here, this new road will open up new access, people will go up here and clear, clear vast areas. Uh, a really, really devastating problem, this road. And we'll also end up with yet more loss of lives uh, amongst human people, uh, humans in the area, which is already a regular occurrence. Now, most of this spatial plan actually contravenes spatial planning laws. You're not allowed to clear areas that are 40 degree slopes, at certain altitudes and everything else. So, most of this spatial plan is illegal, and it's being fast-tracked under the table, and it breaks Indonesia's own spatial planning laws that are supposed to prevent things like that. And people already die by in their hundreds every year due to flash flows because of this inappropriate development, and those numbers are going to go up massively, and the economic losses to agriculture and everything else is going to go up massively as well. 
So we've been sort of battling this as well, as at the same time as the Tripper case, and we've used things like, you know, uh, webinars, we've done several press conferences, we've used petitions. This was a particularly successful one. We got like one and a half million signatories uh, within a, a few weeks. And, uh, you know, the government really has sort of been hammered because every time you sign one of these, the president gets an email, the minister of forestry gets an email, the ambassador for Norway gets an email, and they get fed up of it. And they start picking up the phone and they call in the Indonesian government saying, what are you doing about this? So these things, I, I have no idea if petitions like this will still be useful in five years' time, but right now they've been extremely effective. And I'm getting close to the end, but then we had the fires in Riau and Jambi that caused a lot of haze in Singapore recently. Big thing. And most of these companies are actually registered in Singapore. You know, the fires are in Indonesia, but it's Singaporean companies <coughs> creating haze for Singaporean people. And the Singaporeans came up and said, we'll go after these companies, you know, with a vengeance, and the Indonesian NGOs and the government promised to go after these companies with a vengeance, and Greenpeace has mapped them all out and told them where the fires are. A lot of it learned from the Tripper case. And, uh, but this is a real test. If, if they can't succeed in Tripper, prosecuting these companies for their, you know, one, illegal permits, two, illegal burning of deep peatlands and everything else, um, then what hope is there for them actually enforcing the laws in Riau and preventing all this haze that uh, devastates Singapore and Malaysia every year. And all we're doing is asking Indonesia to uphold its own laws. And it's not just wildlife laws. I, you know, when you think about law enforcement for conservation, not just wildlife laws, but laws that govern permits, laws that govern how companies operate in the field, how they clear forests, laws that govern spatial planning and everything else. It's that whole package just enforcing a few wildlife laws here and there is not enough. We really need to do it. But I'm wondering why it's called extreme conservation. Now I know, because Martha wrote a paper about it. But uh, just upholding, uh, trying to get a country to enforce its own existing laws should not really be considered an extreme, should it? So are we going to see better governance in Indonesia's forests? Only with sustained public pressure, I think. And uh, Facebook, I've learned a lot about Facebook and Twitter and everything else, and it's an extremely useful tool if you want to get behind it. And it suddenly crossed to me that in Sumatra, we, we're right now, I think decisions that are made in the next few weeks uh, probably determine whether we still have Sumatran orangutans, elephants, rhinos, and tigers in 10 years. Right now. So are we going through the age of where we see the great ape extinctions? I have no idea. Maybe in Africa. But I think with the, the threat of palm oil in Africa, then we may well be heading into that kind of scenario. It's getting to crunch time, I think. So anyway, thank you very much. And anybody who wants to support us, go to Facebook and Twitter and get on there and, and help spread petitions and everything else. Next up, we have a combat conservationist in Damien Mander. Uh, he's the founder of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. He's a former sniper in the Australian Special Forces who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. He also managed the Iraq Special Police Training Academy, overseeing the training of up to 700 cadets at a time. Frustrated by the inability of law enforcement and national governments to effectively counter rhino poachers during a trip to Zimbabwe, he founded the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, IAPF, and applied military training and techniques to wildlife units in hopes of protecting endangered species around the world. Let's hear it for... Damien Mander. Thanks, Todd. The World Wildlife War is acknowledged by few and fought by fewer. Whilst funding pours into humanitarian causes, game rangers struggle to defend wildlife. We function on the scraps of an aid industry because intrinsically animals are not considered as important as human beings. Now, I call it a wildlife war because across the world we see criminal syndicates using military precision, poached with swift, calculated ferocity, using automatic weapons, night vision equipment. Well-trained units strike animals while they carry out the most primary desire of any creature, to live. And whilst game rangers are tracking fading footprints from the scene of a crime, the lives they defend with their own are already being traded on the other side of the world. Great apes share the same unfortunate prestige as rhinoceros, elephant, tiger, 
and many other iconic species that the International Anti-Poaching Foundation fights to protect. They are high target species whose very struggle for survival represents that of Mother Nature herself. On only a handful of occasions in the past 500 million years, half of all species on Earth have gone extinct. This is what we term a mass extinction. Our recent study, The Ethics of Species, published by Cambridge University Press, projects that by 2100, half of all species we have on Earth today will be gone forever. Now, for the first time in history, this mass extinction is a man-made phenomenon. So I'm going to speak about Africa now because that's my home. The United Nations Population Division projects that the number of human inhabitants on the African continent will double to 2 billion by 2040. Now, unfortunately, I've got little confidence that we can mobilise the hearts and minds of a continent with a common mindset of immediacy that the long-term preservation of wildlife is more important than food on the table tonight. You couple that with a common lack of sufficient political will to protect these animals and we have a recipe here for extreme challenge. Now, whilst it may take generations or major catastrophe to wake up humanity to this env environmental cause, in the meantime, to save high target species, I believe we must adopt a military approach. Are we ready, financially, logistically, politically and morally, to adopt this mode of thinking? Can we afford to ignore the important contributions that military tactics and technologies can bring to conservation when those same principles are being used by criminal syndicates to destroy high target species? Whether we like it or not, military tactics and technologies are the reality of a successful conservation formula at the front lines of the world wildlife war. Anti-poaching isn't pretty. Rangers do carry guns. Sometimes they're shot, sometimes they shoot. Our camouflage approach to protecting animals may be discomforting for some, particularly when environmentalists, animal rights, humanitarians, military types, conservationists, they all sit at different seats on the ideological spectrum. Despite this, we can and must fight common ground on this devastating global issue. So one of our brave warrior game rangers, his name is John Matenga. And John has conservation beating through his veins. He's been trained and equipped like a soldier. The rhino population that John and his team protect has suffered no loss in five long years. Now outside of his reserve in Victoria Falls, the nearest population of rhinoceros to John's camp has been decimated from 76 down to seven in seven years. So as demonstrated time and time again on the front lines of the world wildlife war, where human intervention can positively change the fate of nature, we must be light-handed no longer. Rangers of the world should be trained, equipped and supported to the levels required in the same custom as our police and military agencies. Alongside our donors, officials and thinkers, we need conservationists that can fight like soldiers and soldiers with the passion of conservationists. To declare war in defence of these dying global treasures may seem sweeping and heavy-handed, but in dire circumstances, it's often only with heavy hands that we have a canvas for the future. This isn't a call for mercenary action or the uprising of a militia, and I'm not expecting tanks and Apaches to roll over the horizon and hand them out like Christmas presents. This is a global call to implement the necessary structured training, technology, intelligence, command and control for anti-poaching, the last lines of defence for wildlife. Protecting high target species must be the benchmark of wildlife defence. When we can protect these animals, the hardest to protect, we know that everything else in that ecosystem is safe from poachers. At a deeper level, such as the culture of war and security has taken over our generation, subsuming the notion of peace as a concept, we must find a way to penetrate the minds of this and future generations with the environmental narrative. Now, this responsibility of a shift towards protecting Mother Nature is ours as a whole. And whilst we can't shift the mindset of a generation overnight, 
we can save high target species today. But to do that, force is a vital prescription. Before I close, I'm going to leave you with some words of Winston Churchill, who summarises the essence of common enemy we face and the resolve required to save high target species. You ask, what is our policy? And I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might, with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? And I can answer with one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Let that be realised. We need the help of the world to defend the defenceless. And where those people of the world cannot help us protect animals, and I mean any animals, then I lay down the challenge now to not be responsible for their suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. So from Sumatra to Zimbabwe, we're going to head northward in Africa, and I'd like to next introduce Leon Lamprecht, who's with African Parks. African Parks is a nonprofit organization that takes on the long-term management of national parks in partnership with governments and local communities. The organization currently manages seven protected areas in six different countries. Leon is the operations director in charge of African Parks operations in Chad, Republic of Congo, DRC, and Ethiopia. Until recently, he was the African Parks manager of Adzala Kokoa National Park in the Republic of Congo, where he made great strides toward combating the rampant levels of poaching in the park. Since 2011, he and his team have arrested a number of poachers around Adzala, including several kingpins in the ivory trade. An amnesty agreement reached with poachers earlier this year turned out to be extremely successful with 65 poachers handing in their weapons in return for the opportunity to be trained as eco-guards. Let's give a round of applause to Leon. Thanks, Todd. This is about extreme conservation. Um, African Parks, like we just said, is a non-profit organization, and we take the direct responsibility of the re rehabilitation of these national parks on long-term management in partnership with local governments. Um, if I look quickly at what we mean with, with management, first of all, we have to secure the park. If, if we do not have a park secured, um, there's no way we'll be able to, re to achieve what we would like to achieve. Infrastructure obviously comes with that, uh, translocation, monitoring where that's necessary. And then second from the bottom, building a constituency for conservation. If we do not get the buy-in from the communities, we will never succeed. And then lastly, we'll have to secure the funding, but we need tourism or we need dollars in the hands of the people to see the, the long-term benefits. Um, why are we effective? African Parks is 10 years old. Uh, this year we've started in Malawi and, and Zambia exactly 10 years ago. Uh, we are growing. Uh, yesterday we were still at seven parks. Today we signed two more contracts in Malawi. We're at nine parks and hopefully by the end of this month we'll be at 10 parks with another project in Ethiopia. Um, why are we effective? We take long-term responsibility. If we cannot get a mandate of at least 20 years, we will not be able to to do this. Um, we need strong, dedicated uh, law enforcement teams. If we don't have that, we will not su succeed. And then, like I've just said, we need the buy-in from the community. If we don't have the buy-in from the community, these parks will stop existing as, as parks the day that our anti-poaching teams leave the park. 
If we go back to Odzala, which is the only African parks project where we have great apes, we have a few chimpanzee in Garamba National Park and DRC, but they're mainly outside of the park. If we look at the great apes in Odzala, um, 2010 November, we signed the partnership agreement with the government, um, and it was the first public-private partnership in Central Africa. Threats and challenges that the great apes face, or face in, in Odzala, it's a tradition of hunting. The forest is abundant. Um, normal subsistence bushmeat poaching does not have a, a problem on, on a lot of the species, but unfortunately, as soon as it becomes commercial, we're facing a big problem. The four years before African parks got involved in Odzala, not a single patrol was done in the interior of the park. Unfortunately, also a lot of the eco-guards were not paid salaries, so we had a lot of corruption among the, the eco-guards. Lots of illegal hunting of, of the great apes. A very big problem with elephant poaching. Big, massive syndicates getting involved. Mainly trade further to the north of, of Congo. And then poor governance. I'm sure this has come out in other presentations, and I'm su sure this will come out again. If we do not have the buy-in from the governments, we will not succeed. We can do all the work we need to do on the ground, but we need that buy-in. Um, our anti-poaching modus operandi, this is just a normal control post on the edge of the park, and you can see the gorilla hands there, among other bush meat being transported to the market. You can also see, you can also see the um, terrapin there, all kinds of endangered species go through these control posts. Our um, modus operandi, we have to weed out corruption. That's our biggest enemy at this stage. After that, we have to train our teams, equip them. We need to patrol strategically. We found that rapid response units work very, very well. We do not have the funding to deploy these guys by helicopter, but where we can, we deploy them as quickly as possible if we've spotted um, poaching activities with great success. And then this year we started an amnesty program. The amnesty program at the end of about four months, we had 65 poachers turn in their, their, their firearms. Seven of the statements that we got from these poachers resulted in the arrest and the conviction of a very, very big kingpin in the southern part of the park, mainly in, in elephant poaching. It also a teacher that worked in the north, mainly with pygmy children, could not support his family on the salary that he was getting. He turned to be a poacher. And when he had this op opportunity through the amnesty program, he stopped poaching and now has a, a legal job. But in the process, managed to turn seven of the pygmy hunters that was working in his area to also join our ranks. And then lastly, we have to influence the judicial system. Um, in the uh, meeting yesterday, I'm sure the, some of the organizations like Lager and PALF was addressed. Without the assistance of these guys in the legal system, we will not be able to, to survive either. What still needs to be done? We need the, the buy-in from the community. And in our park, we need community-based tourism. It is in the tourism development plan. It's the next thing that we'll have to roll out with the government. And we have to find alternative livelihoods if the community do not buy in and they need the money to survive, there's no way they're going to look after an animal that they could eat. Um, together with the ministry, we have to look at diminishing the, the bushmeat trade. And on our own case, we have to increase intelligence. Um, it's a lot easier to stop an uh, incident once it's happened. It's more difficult to stop it before the time, but we have to stop it before it happens. In conclusion, I don't want to step on any toes. I know there's a lot of technology being discussed here. But in our case, right now, we need boots on the ground. And that's what's, what's making us successful. Without long-term management, like I said, these protectors areas will not last. Thanks. Thank you, Leon. Well done. Now we're moving to Uganda. Uh, the territory of Martha Robbins. Martha is a scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. 
She's been studying gorillas for over 20 years, focusing on topics such as social behavior, feeding ecology, and population dynamics. Martha's longstanding research project in Bowindi Impenetrable National Park, Uganda, has been running for 15 years and has produced collaborations with projects in various countries, including Rwanda and Gabon. Thank you, Martha. Thank Let's you. hear it for her. Is this on? Okay, hi, hi. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the extreme dude session. This is <laughs> interesting. Anyway, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I'll be talking about the um, mountain gorillas of the Virunga volcanoes, essentially as a case study for extreme conservation. Um, and this is also, I think it's, it's a case study that really stresses the importance of collaborative work among governments, NGOs, research institutes, and so forth. Um, I, what I'm presenting here is summarizing work done over more than the past 40 years by a huge number of people, many of whom are actually in this room. Um, I also think it serves as a good example of the importance of monitoring and assessing whether strategies are actually working or not, which hasn't really been, been mentioned very much. Anybody who owns a business will keep track of whether what they're doing works or not. Um, if you own a toothpaste company, you want to know how many tubes of toothpaste you're making, how many you're selling, and whether you're making a profit. And if you're not, is it because the toothpaste tastes bad or you're not marketing right or whatever? We, we also need to do that within conservation. Um, so mountain gorillas of the Virungas. Uh, yes. Um, so there are extreme threats to this population, and there have been for quite some time. I realize a lot has been talked about mountain, about mountain gorillas already during this um, meeting, but uh, it's partially because they, they're one of the, the first populations that, has, that attracted attention, um, both from a research and a, a conservation standpoint. Um, most of the threats there are very similar to what we have in other areas. Mountain gorillas have lived in a small island population for, for decades now. Um, at the, the worst point, this population hit a low of about 250 animals in the, the mid-1980s. Um, there's huge human pressures surrounding nearby. I think everybody's aware that this area has been racked by political instability and war for over 20 years now. Um, the risk of poaching, um, one, reason that this area is very fortunate is that people in this region actually don't eat primates or they don't eat apes, which has been <laughs> extremely fortunate for this population. But snares are set for dike or small antelope, and the gorillas can get their hands and feet caught in these. And then there, there also are other cases of incidental killings during the war or intentional killings. Um, so the gorillas have been directly targeted some as well. And then there is a big concern of risk of disease outbreaks, um, disease transmission from humans, both from, the, from tourists that are visiting them in close proximity, or again, simply because there are many, many people living in surrounding areas. Um, so it, the extreme management that this population has received, on a, on a broader scale, um, there is an extremely high density of park staff working, working there. In this very small park, there are more park staff, staff working there than in all of Gabon, as a comparison, in more in this very small area than in 13 national parks in Gabon. Um, the NGOs and governments have also initiated quite a lot of community development projects on many levels. Where things differ with mountain gorillas compared to a lot of other apes is that quite a number of groups have been hit, habituated over the years, um, and currently more than 70% of this population is habituated. And by this I mean they can be contacted closely. Um, we have essentially gained our trust of these animals. Um, and they're not going to run away when we contact them. These are the groups that are visited by research and tourists on, or research and tourists on a daily basis. So these groups are, are monitored daily. Um, part of that with the habituated animals is that there's been an extremely successful tourism program there. And this was, this was discussed quite a lot yesterday in the, in the tourism um, sector. But just to give you an idea, it's, it's really quite a large number of people um, that go to experience this. And another thing that's very unique in this um, with mountain gorillas and is only possible because of the animals being habituated is that there's a veterinary program there where 
If animals get caught in snares or if they're suffering from respiratory diseases, the veterinarians can go, literally go in the forest, anesthetize the animals, treat them, and then the gorillas are back in their social groups within half an hour or less. And again, this, this is a very unique um, situation, extreme, part of the extreme. So in terms of the whole population, as I've said, quite a number of them are, are habituated. And so essentially, the population is made up of the habituated gorillas and then the ones that are unhabituated. So the population as a whole is receiving high levels of, of, of anti-poaching patrols and so forth. But again, these habituated animals are getting additional protection because they're monitored daily. If necessary, there can be um, veterinary care. So the question is, in terms of effectiveness of strategies, has this population benefited from extreme conservation? And in particular, have the habituated gorillas benefited even more? So this population also, we're very fortunate, has been extremely well monitored. This is the best monitored populations of apes we have anywhere. Um, censuses of literally the whole population where teams literally sweep the forest trying to count every gorilla there. Um, we've done, seven of these have been conducted um, over more than the past 40 years. And then with the habituated animals, we, we've been able to get daily observations on individually identified animals. So we have very detailed database of births and deaths of, of all the gorillas that have passed through um, the habituated groups. And here on this graph, over time, the line at the top is how the total populations changed over time. So as I said, in the, in the mid-80s, the population hit a low of about 250. And then in 2010, it was up to 480 animals. So it almost doubled in 25 years, which is remarkable. Um, at the same time, the number of habituated gorillas was going up. Part of this was because additional groups were habituated. That's what the, every little black triangle there is just when a, another group was habituated. Um, but at the same time, the, the number of, of habituated animals is, has, was growing also simply because they were growing. Um, because the, the, the population was growing. But the question was, is were those habituated gorillas doing better than the, than the total population? And uh, I know a bit more numbers here. Um, the annual growth rate of the entire population since the 1970s has been 1%. Um, and this is actually is a very healthy growth rate for a population. And we were aware of that through, through the routine censuses. So right there, it's like, yeah, things are going well you know, we, for, for this po gorilla population. But when we look more closely at the habituated groups, and again, we controlled for adding in additional habituated groups. When we looked at the habituated groups, like, wow, they're growing at a 4% annual growth rate. This is a phenomenal growth rate. But what's concerning is that we realized at the same time, the unhabituated groups were actually experiencing a negative growth rate. So again, these animals were receiving, you know, lots and lots of ranger patrols, but it um, essentially what we could conclude that the differences in the growth rate between the habituated and unhabituated likely arose because they were receiving better protection from this daily monitoring and the ability that we could go in and, and conduct veterinary interventions. So the, the difference was because of in between the habituated and unhabituated was due to differences in mortality not birth rates or anything. So essentially, extreme measures were needed to achieve positive growth rate um, in this population and, and with the habituated gorillas. So I think, I think, again, trying to use this as a case study and really step back and reflect a bit and say, is this a, an example of a success story? Or is this actually a really like, whoa, cautionary tale as to what it is taking us to see things work well to conserve endangered apes? And I think the answer is a bit ye yes for both. As a success story, the population's nearly doubled in size. It's the only population of ape that we know is actually increasing in size. The three countries where, where this population is found, Rwanda, DRC, Uganda, are ex very actively involved in gorilla conservation. They, they see the importance, and, and I think we have very good um, I think they, they're setting an extremely good example for other range states. But we have less than 1,000 mountain gorillas. There's only one other population of mountain gorillas in the world in, in Windy Impenetrable National Park. 
Less than 1,000 is not many. <laughs> um, there's ongoing political problems in DRC as we speak. Um, there are many, many more ongoing challenges with these populations, which I, 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 I can't go into in this time. But essentially, we cannot be complacent. So rather than patting ourselves on the back and saying, yeah, we succeeded, we cannot be complacent, even in this area that has received so much more attention um, than a lot of other areas with the orangutans burning and so forth. Um, just throwing out a few thought points as where I think this really is a, a cautionary tale is it demonstrates the massive amount of work that's necessary to, to protect critically endangered species or, or see a, a, a positive sign. And, and also for us to really think, you know, how heavily do we want or do we need to manage this grade eight population in terms of, you know, again, where in, in this case where so many of the animals are habituated, you know, where do we want to stop with, with managing them? And how much can this be applied in other areas? I mean, in particularly, a lot of these methods, it, it's not really possible to scale up. I mean, Otsala, where you're talking about, is more than 10 times as big as this population. We can't habituate thousands of gorillas. And, and we can't, I mean, so again, how do we scale these things up? Is that really possible? And, and, I, and then my last point, which I think was part of the, the point behind having the session and even having this whole uh, meeting was, we really do need to develop additional approaches and, and think out of the box um, because time is ticking and, and we're losing so many apes. Um, and then lastly, just I, I really want to acknowledge the, the park services and the NGOs that have been working in this area and particularly the hundreds of people that have worked on the ground and the large numbers that have, have lost, lost their lives while protecting gorillas. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Last but certainly not least, we have Javier Proto. Javier is a graduate student at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology at the University of Pampu uh, Fodre in Barcelona. He's currently studying great ape genetic diversity with Tomar Marquez Bonet. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. And um, well, I'll, I'll speak. Uh, I'll talk about a very different topic uh, that these guys are, are, are really speaking about. I mean, their work is mainly on the ground. Our work in, is in the lab. And I think we can, we can provide methods and we can provide techniques that are, are really useful for, for conservation people in the ground that, that, can, that can collaborate with us and, and, and with the, the work we have done, we can, we can try to, to get a better approach in, in order to pr preserve these, these great animals. So uh, I'm, I'm speaking in, on behalf of, of my supervisor, which is Tomas Marquez. I'm, I'm now doing uh, my, my PhD. And we have worked in close collaboration with Christina Wilson, which is from the Copenhagen Zoo, uh, which also uh, is in the managing of, of uh, zoos in, in, in Europe. So to start uh, DNA, uh, it's what we all have, and we must be aware that DNA can tell us a lot of things about, about us uh, and about our population history as, as a whole. Um, the main issue about, about, uh, about conservation genetics in, in, in the field is that um, non-invasive samples, it's, it's really difficult to work with, and at the moment, um, most of the research that is done it's done in a very few markers in, in the genome, so covering a very small portion of the genome. Now, with uh, newer technologies that are uh, improving really fast, are decreasing the cost of sequencing, and with better quality DNA samples, we can, we can um, scale up uh, this analysis of, of the genomes of, of great apes. So, uh, also to, to give a, an overview on, on how uh, conservation can be uh, helped by the usage of, of, uh, of genetics. Um, we must recognize that uh, with, uh, with DNA testing, we, we have been able to, to get great, great insights in phil phylogeography, in zoonosis studies, uh, as two days ago uh, we were talking about. Uh, we are able to, to, to look at how this population evolved in terms of, uh, sample, in, in terms of uh, population sizes, 
and migrations and, and paternity testing, for instance. And one thing that it's not yet um, applied for great tapes is how, uh, is how DNA testing can be useful for, for, um, for trying to, to assign the, the origin of, of these samples that are, are being traded throughout all, all over the world. Um, and, and also for, for the Bashmi trading. To do that, we, we need a, a base what to rely on. So, so this, uh, three years ago, we started a project with uh, uh, Christina, with Tomas, and more than eight groups uh, throughout the world. You can see the, the author list of, of this collaboration. It was uh, a great collaboration between ma many groups. And the main problem of, of, of great tapes is that the genetic diversity that they bear, it's, it's poorly understood, despite we, we have great insights in human uh, populations, how, how their the diversity, it's, uh, in terms of, of genetic diversity, it's, uh, it's, it's covered. Uh, in, in great apes, it's, 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 there, there is nothing known about, about uh, great ape diversity. So what we did is uh, we sampled 80 different uh, individuals from all the subspecies, uh, uh, great ape subspecies of Africa, but mountain gorillas, uh, and also the two species of, of orangutans. And, and we sequence the whole genome of, 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 of these individuals. We, we discovered more than 80 million variants, and, and this is a, a, a great resource that, that we can now use in order to, to, to provide uh, this genetic testing for, for these uh, samples that, that we don't know where are coming from. So using this, this, uh, this information, now we can we can, we can determine which are the subspecies of uh, where these uh, uh, illegal trading are, are coming from. So with unknown samples that, uh, that you don't know the origin, you can determine now uh, which is the, which is the, um, the subspecies level. But we are working in, in order to, to get more sampling throughout all, all over uh, Africa uh, and also uh, Indonesia with orangutans to get specific populations and, and try to, to get a genetic map in order to assign more precisely which is the, which is the region where these uh, samples are coming from. So what, what, what can this level of, of, of complexity and this level of sampling can, can help us? So in, in humans, it is well known um, for a few years that um, when, when you try to do this, this kind of analysis using these, these genetic markers, at, at the end, for instance, here you, you can see the, the map of, of Europe, and, and here you can see that essentially the genetic map, the genetic diversity that is there uh, throughout Europe is resembled in, in a map of, of Europe with uh, Iberia here, France, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, and so on. So why, why cannot we do that with, uh, with great tapes and then we can know where these uh, illegal trading samples are coming from? So um, one of the applications that we, <coughs> that we did uh, with, uh, with, our, with our work that was published this year is that, for instance, this is, this is our samples that we had for, for gorillas. And here you have the different uh, origins that they have. Uh, uh, one problem that we have is most of the times we don't know where these samples are coming from. So we, we have to study them to, in order to characterize this variation. But, uh, but still, we, we, we need to, to have better sampling with georeference in order to, to do a more improved uh, analysis. But for instance, here you, you can see that the Cameroon samples are coming here with uh, Equatorial Guinea, and then the, the Congo samples are coming here. Um, there are some outliers as well, uh, but we have, we have to work in order to get better sampling to, to determine uh, a, a map. And, and now we're working in a, se a second phase of, 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 of our work. And, and we are, we're sampling uh, more different locations in order, in order to, to characterize better this, this variation. So where, where does this bring us? Uh, what, what are our problems and our, and our issues? So, so we need a better collaboration. And, and we need to, to focus more uh, with people on, uh, in the field in order to, to accomplish both this conservation effort in order to, um, in order to, to give uh, these, uh, these applications uh, to, to the problems that, 
that are arising with great apes. Uh, one issue is also money. Uh, to do these testings, it costs money, and, and we need to, to also ask to the funding agencies that support these conservation efforts. Uh, we, we have problems sometimes in order to sell a conservation application of this into the research agencies. So where are the alternatives that we can get in order to, to do the genetic testing on these samples? And finally, uh, one point that was arised also from Dominic Travis is that uh, non-invasive samples are, are not suitable at the moment for us to, to do this, uh, to do this uh, discovery of variants that will determine which is the origin. At the end, with non-invasive samples, we will be, we will be able to, to determine the illegal trade. But in order to discover the, the variants that will tell us where these, uh, where these samples, we, we need at the moment uh, invasive samples. Um, but we are working in order to, to improve these methods uh, to get also good quality DNA from, from, from non-invasive samples. And with that all, uh, I would like to, to thank our collaborators uh, with the Great Ape Genome Consortium that was really helpful, Maria Teresa Bello and June November that uh, did these, uh, these implementations of these methods. Uh, and thank you very much. I have some questions, but what I'd really like to do is throw this open uh, to the audience. I'm sure you have questions um, pertaining to extreme conservation, our topic. Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose? Please. My question is mostly for, for Ian. Okay. Um, I am really, really scared for Congo uh, regarding uh, the 180 to 470,000 hectares that's probably going to be cut uh, because of the Atama palm oil plantation. And so we're in this really early phase where we're about to see what could be the disaster that you guys have seen in Indonesia, unfortunately. So my question to you would be, what could we do at this early phase? Do you have any advice for Central Africa? I mean, these, these types of palm oil plantations are coming to a lot of countries, not just Congo. Uh, DRC, Cameroon. I know there's been, some huge, uh, there's been some huge allegations of corruption with the Heracles plantation in Cameroon. Uh, I mean, what advice do you have for Central Africa so that we can be prepared because this is coming? I think if I knew the answer on how to stop palm oil expansion, I wouldn't be here. But the first thing that comes to my mind is, is get updated on what your spatial planning regulations are and what, which areas are off limits and which areas shouldn't be. Basically, you, the country, each country has its own spatial planning sort of criteria, yeah? In, in, in Indonesia, you call them like bibit or something. So you say like everything that's over 40 degrees slope, 40, yeah, 40% 40 slope is supposedly off limits. Everything is, which is Bukit Pandan uh, soil type is off limits. And, and map it. And so that when the governments do start handing out these concessions, you can go up to them and say, look guys, that's breaking the law, it's off limits. I think that's the only defense, but I would, add, I would recommend that all the African countries, the NGOs working actually start to try and do that try and map out which areas should be available for agricultural expansion legally and which areas should be off limits. And then you have some ammunition to combat them when they do start handing out permits. Hi, Dave Morgan from the Gula Gautron Lake Project. And this uh, question is directed at Damien. And um, one thing is, I was wondering, are you planning on, one question is, are you planning on expanding into Central Africa? And if you've already got uh, the works going on that. And the other is, uh, with regards to that, I think um, it will definitely work. I think giving attention to the eco guards that are underpaid, uh, the capacity is not there for their training, and they're facing poachers now that are, are much more serious because it's really ivory driven and they're very serious. And we're finding out that we're having a lot of firefights. Um, with your model, have you ever used uh, public campaigns as well uh, to reach out? Because I think in Central Africa, what we found is if you start using these type of tactics or you use new technology, uh, people in those regions who aren't aware of it, they start talking and it can really help out. I mean, people will become scared. And I think uh, using the media or different NGOs, that could have a big impact at least uh, stopping some of the local people, uh, the traditional gathers and stuff from going into areas where they shouldn't be hunting 
uh, just by the fact that they think and they know that these eco guards are being trained by people who are uh, well equipped to, to do their job, which in many places isn't the case at this time. No, thanks very much for that. And and one of the the problems we face is trying to replicate something that uh, that does work and, and getting other people to adopt those models. One thing we noticed uh, a lot in Southern Africa is you, you have an ageing population of people in the conservation industry who have combat experience. And so you've now got a generation of people who have been pushed up through the ranks uh, as game farmers, uh, as scientists, as conservationists who don't really have that full grasp of how to run a paramilitary operation and we can package up anti-poaching any way we like it but it is a paramilitary operation out there. Uh, so one of the things we looked at uh, was the, the standards of ranger training and what was available uh, in southern Africa. They have a, a field ranger one qualification. So a ranger can come in for six weeks at the age of 17 and do this qualification and still be doing the same job at the age of 57. There's no career path for him, there's nothing to steer him up towards a management position, getting all the necessary training along the way throughout his career in how to eventually manage or train an anti-poaching operation. And so we, uh, we started, we brought the model into South Africa and we tried to lay it over the current unit standards in the South African Qualification Authority and realised that there was no qualification there that, that supported what we felt and what some key players in the industry felt was required for rangers to go out there on the front lines and not only them for defend, to defend wildlife but for their managers to be able to manage those rangers out there. And so we, we, we went about, we're currently in the process of developing a new qualification in South Africa which will be event, uh, eventually recognised throughout the Southern African development community of anti-poaching ranger and it's a six tiered qualification and uh, it focuses uh, right in the very beginning from low literacy learning going right through uh, anti-poaching ranger level one, level two, team leader, uh, intelligence and risk assessment and then branching off either to be in management or instructor. And uh, w we received uh, remarkable feedback from an international community when we sent out the expression of interest. Uh, the, the carrot was that if those people from the international community come in and discuss what they think the frameworks should be, and we'll have a selection of frameworks that will suit different regions, uh, and they have a positive contribution to the development of the curriculum then at the end of it, provided they agree to meet minimum standards within the, within the industry and maintain the security of those documents, they'll have co-ownership of the qualification and curriculum at the end of it. So we're currently sitting with 58 industry leaders from 23 countries, uh, including uh, government departments from eight countries who have agreed to take part in that process. Uh, we're just dump, jumping through the hoops at the moment because the first step has to be the qualification development, which is being done in South Africa. To fill an immediate gap in the industry, we've got managers. Now, South Africa, again, I'll use it as an example. There's 10,000 game reserves, private game reserves in South Africa. Each of them has a manager. Each of them has, to, to a certain degree, uh, a responsibility of managing a small or medium-sized paramilitary operation. And a lot of these guys do not have the background in, in how to run those, those operations. They don't have the, the skill sets. And it's through no fault of their own. They've, they've, they've taken on the job and the huge responsibility of looking after these animals. And we, we started working with a group of guys down in Cape Town. It's an interesting story, actually. A group of young guys who developed a, an online training college for the hospitality industry uh, a few years ago. Now, that online college currently services half a million learners a day. And so what we're doing now is taking a lot of the theory that a manager must know to manage an anti-poaching operation and putting it into an online college. So it means the manager... Uh, because you can't take a manager away from his job for the time that's required to give him the training that's required to get the job done. You just simply can't do it. He has such a huge responsibility there. So this online college is going to allow managers to learn all the theory that's required of running a, a paramilitary operation in their own workplace, at their own time. They'll have access to a facilitator, either by phone or online, and a community of people uh, online who have already passed courses that they're trying to pass. And so what it means is when managers do get a chance to get away from their workplace and go to a training facility, they'll all be on the same level and ready to start training at the same time as opposed to what you do see so often in a classroom environment is people coming in who are, uh, uh, with skill levels down here, some up here and the rest in the middle and half the course is spent trying to bring everyone up to a level where we can move forward. And so that's, a, that's an immediate tool. In terms of um, the media, uh, yes, we, we, we have worked a lot with the media and I understand the, the valuable importance of, of using the media to tell the story uh, to an international community. And I, I don't think that can be overstated enough, how important the media is in, in getting this, this mission out there. 
Uh, not my mission, everyone's mission, everyone in this room's mission, everyone in this industry's mission, because we really need to penetrate those minds that this is something worthwhile fighting for. Crowdsourcing, I'd love to do it. If anyone can help me, please. Is that, is that, okay, thank you. Anybody else, please. Thanks, this is really a great session because I think you're dealing with the, the real core frontline challenges that we have to come to grips with if we're going to be successful. And if we don't engage at the level that you're engaging at, I think everything else we're doing is going to be for naught. Um, I really take my hats off to everything that, that you're doing. You know, Ian, Martha, a friend from Parks Founders. This is not extreme conservation. This is plain and simple what we need to do to get the job done. Damien, you're taking it to another level, looking at these kind of paramilitary operations. But for instance, with rhino poaching in South Africa, I don't see any other way to deal with it. If we don't engage the way that you're suggesting, I think we're going to fail in, in some of these really extreme cases. But I have a, some question, a question for uh, Ian in particular. And uh, you're aware of the great carbon storage value of the, uh, the peat swamp forests. They store something like 3,000 tons per hectare, which is 10 times an Amazon forest, for example. Uh, you now have a Red Plus agency in, uh, in Indonesia, and there's at least one situation where some entrepreneurs are trying to get a fairly large uh, carbon concession in Kalimantan for, uh, for peat forest. I wonder if you could uh, comment on that, whether you see that as an option uh, for, uh, for the immediate future, because as you've noted, we need to deal with all of this in the next... Uh, in the next year or two, otherwise a lot of these forests are gonna be gone. I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that know a lot more about carbon trading and the potential of red than I do, but um, it's something that we've tried to push with the peat swamps, obviously, because the, you know, the value of these forests as intact standing forests on deep peat, which is essentially just pure carbon, is way, way higher than the potential revenues over uh, a short term from palm oil. So it's not even an economic uh, incentive. What's even worse in the tripper case is that when you dry out these peatlands and plant palm oil, they uh, subside by about 2.5 meters in the first 25 years, so the first crop of palm oil. And potentially all of tripper or most of it is going to be under the sea after just one palm oil crop. So all this destruction and devastation, loss of biodiversity, loss of not just livelihoods, but actually villages and everything else is for nothing, really. It's just pure and simple greed. Now, if we could utilize a, a red program to save this uh, and to develop it I think that's probably the way to go and we really want to look into that but the first thing we have to do is just stop this greed from destroying everything and we've looked in you know people have looked at Ache on several cases trying to develop red programs up in the Ulu Masin area uh, that kind of fizzled out it was eventually bought up by a Canadian mining company which incidentally was boasting a few months ago about how it had successfully lobbied to free up over one million hectares of these forests uh, in the Aceh government. And so it's kind of a dilemma. I, 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 like to think, I like to think that red has vast potential for saving forests like the peat and also the great Alosa ecosystem. But there's also, you know, there's this separatist, this political thing. It's like, who gets the money? And I think in Indonesia, there's, there's massive confusion about whether the money should be put through the central government, it should go through a provincial government, that obviously the district government thinks that they own it, the villagers think that they own it, and the corruption uh, mixed into that sort of recipe is, is a major, major stumbling block. I don't really see how we can develop anything fast enough to have a real impact here. Whereas, if we can succeed in enforcing the law and getting some of these companies removed from Tripa, there is vast potential for uh, restoration of, of Tripa, for developing a long-term carbon program to save and restore Tripa, and for regenerating the forest and for reintroducing some of the species that may have already gone. So we, we'd love to see it, but we're not there yet. The first thing we have to do is stop the destruction. I think, I think I'll start off with um, this question to Martha. It's interesting what we've been hearing in the Virungas that habituated groups are growing faster than unhabituated groups. Have you been able to do those comparisons in Bwindi? And then um, for the person who presented on Odzala, that's a very interesting model, African parks. Um, one thing that I can say is, you know, just looking at Uganda Wildlife Authority, we find that in order for it to be sustainable, we have to get enough tourists. It's probably the same, you know, all over Africa, Kenya, Tanzania. And I think the biggest challenge with Odzala, because it's so difficult to get to, is getting the tourists in. You know, once 
I don't know how you're funding it. I'm sure you have private investors, but then you also have grants. And once that money runs out, if you don't have enough tourists coming in, you can't even really have a viable community ecotourism. So how have you thought about dealing with that issue? Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks Gladys. <laughs> I'm not surprised you asked me. Um, so Buen for those of you who don't know, Bwindi Impenetrable National Park in Uganda is the other population of mountain gorillas. Um, I would like to apply this same approach of, of examining this with Bwindi. There's a few methodological issues. Um, one, we haven't, uh, the censuses of the whole populations of, of Bwindi, as you know with the recent results where we've been applying genetics, have shown that it's much harder to gauge how much the population as a whole has changed. Um, with the habituated groups there, there's also the, the challenge of well-kept records on the habituated groups, and we're working together with UWA um, on that as well. And, and I think that, again, it, it shows how difficult it is to have monitoring well enough to actually really be examining this. One, other, one thing I would like to say, though, is that there have been fewer veterinary interventions in, in Bwindi. Um, there's, even though it's very close by, there's, there appear to be fewer snares set in Bwindi than in the Virungas. Even in, in one area in the Virungas where um, most of the tourist groups are concentrated and where most of the research groups are concentrated, and there's massive numbers of, of park stuff going in there, they're still pulling more than a thousand snares a year out of that area. So these poachers are, are very desperate to be setting snares for antelope. So even in areas with very intensive efforts, this is happening. Um, so I think one challenge for people working there is, yes, there are veterinarians that can go in and remove snares from the habituated gorillas, but how do we get people to stop set setting these snares in the first place? Um, and then lastly, just an, one other little aside thing, and, and since I've got the question from Gladys, who is a Ugandan, I think as a, a challenge to everybody in this room, one thing we need to apply extremely is extreme capacity building. It was pointed out yesterday, there's, there's 23 country, range countries where apes are found. Less than half of those, there are people from less than half of those countries actually at this meeting. So I think we all also really need to work on capacity building and, and working together with, our, with the range states to um, that the next time we have a Great Ape Summit, we have much better representation from, from the range states here. Uh, regarding the tourism question, um, I think is probably the most important part in Odzala. African parks categorizes the parks that we manage in three categories. Category one, those that within our mandate will be self-sustainable. We're fortunate that in Rwanda and in Malawi we have that. Uh, category two, at this stage in Zambia, we have parks that about 50% of, of the operational costs are covered by income, mainly tourism. And then in Chad, in DRC, and in Odzala, it is the, the challenge that you mentioned. Um, but in Odzala, tourism is starting to, to pick up. Um, we've got two lodges, one lodge uh, mainly concentrating on the habituated gorillas um, close to the park uh, headquarters. And then another lodge in the south of the park. Like I said, for the four years before African Parks' involvement, there were no patrols in the interior of the park. There was one ranger post in the south of the park, and that's where a lodge has been created. We already, for seven months this year, at um, over 300 guests. These guests stay for a minimum of six days, and they pay $1,000 per day. So um, it's already picking up in a country where, which is not known as a tourism destination, which got the bad name of Congo. We... Um, We've got our neighbors Congo next door with a lot of, of unrest and people do not want to come to the Republic of Congo. So we have to put it on the, on the map, but we also have to create a product. Um, and that's what this conservation is about. Um, if we're not looking after these gorillas, there's no reason for those tourists to come there. So we've, we've got a long task ahead of us for the next 20 years to do that. Um, I do not think we will ever become a, a category one park where we can cover our operational budget but we aim in the next 10 years to be at least at 50%, and the indication at this stage is that we will be able to do that. For Javier, uh, the work you're doing on genetics, it seems to me is critical, because in all the panels I've heard, at some point genetics comes up. Um, I have a very direct question. What kind of funding 
do you require? Can you give us a ballpark estimate of what you require to expand your work along the lines of what you laid out there? And then uh, two comments. Um, I, I, as I said uh, on Saturday, the potential of the, millennium, the evolution of the Millennium Development Goals in the United Nations and the establishment of the Sustainable Development Goals provides an incredible opportunity to put down some, uh, not only goals, but targets and indicators in the areas that you're covering, in these extreme areas. And doing so will bring donor financing, uh, at least in the next decade. I would propose that this group consider how to have an extreme intervention in this government policy making exercise to pair up forests with biodiversity. You've all talked about the significance and importance, so having that work, and I know Braulio Diaz, who is my counterpart, uh, I'm forest in the UN and uh, policy, and then Braulio is the head of the Convention on Biological Diversity. W is, would be very interested in taking this approach. Um, and finally, uh, several of you have spoken and speakers have pointed out, legality veri verification, I believe, will be an incredibly important tool. And both the uh, Europe and the United States have created legislation which enforces against any product coming in, and that's from forests and trees. So the extent you can map out the legal requirements in the countries where you are, and then move to work with the governments which have made commitments to enforce those laws, uh, you have an actual um, real legal basis to push them to take actions. And so being aware of that broader landscape is critical. But Javier, I'm interested to know uh, the costs that you estimate, that where you would like to see genetics going. Yeah, so the, um, I've, I've been talking uh, with Naftali uh, yesterday about, about this issue, and, and essentially the, the main problem is how to identify these samples coming from illegal trade. So it's a two-step process. The first process is that we have to identify uh, all the different populations from, from all the different countries and from all the different uh, national parks uh, where, these, uh, where these animals are, 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 are living. And, and this is a, a first step process that we need to talk with, field, with the people from the field and, and we need to get these samples in order to characterize um, this genetic variation that it, it will help us um, finally to, to identify the, the samples that we don't know where are coming from. So, so that's the first step, step process and that's mainly uh, about collaboration and, and about authorities allowing us doing this. So that, that shouldn't be uh, money. And then the discovery, um, the discovery phase of this, so we have to take these known samples and we have to sequence them. In our project, we first started with 80 uh, individuals covering all the subspecies uh, of, of great apes, uh, orangutan, chimpanzee, bonobos, all, all of them. And, and we now, we can identify uh, at the subspecies level very well. Uh, so, and, and this project costed more than uh, half a million uh, euros. Um, there are other techniques that we can use in order to, to make this, this cost uh, a bit less if we do some uh, population level estimates of variation that, that was applied uh, for humans recently and that can um, reduce the cost uh, for a specific conservation application. So, so that would be able to do maybe with, with less money, but, but the but the core of, of this project would be to, to get these samples and, and characterize all the variation uh, throughout, throughout uh, Africa and, and also uh, Indonesia um, and so on. And the second phase of the project would be to get these uh, illegal traded animals and, and that would be with less cost, with the known markers that we can use to identify uh, them. That, that would cost maybe $100 per, per sample or even less depending depending on, on the technology, how, how it evolves. So, so that would be more or less the numbers. Oh, okay, we're gonna have one more question, okay. and then we're, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists in 30 seconds, if you could change one thing, what would you do? So 
please. Uh, th thank you so much. I, I defer to um, um, the head of the UN Forum on Forests because she was behind the camera and you wouldn't be able to see that she was waving. Um, but it's partly to, to, to do with Jan's work that I wanted to just make a comment rather than a question. And that's as much directed to the filmmakers in the room because this is a film festival. And that is to contextualize. This has been one of the most dynamic and, and dramatic and, and shocking of the sessions that we've had. And many of us will be thinking, we're here because we're really interested in apes and they're lovely and we don't want to see them disappear. Um, since 2007, a lot of my work with GRASP was focused on the, the climate convention. And the reason for that is that apes are keystone species in these forests. Now, in the climate convention since 2007 and the Bali roadmap, forests have been recognized as central. We will not stop dangerous climate change if we don't stop deforestation. And I just wanted to tell you uh, 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 an exchange I had with a, a carbon scientist when I stood up and said about the importance in, in a meeting in, in one of the uh, UN climate uh, uh, side events, I, I spoke about the importance of, of apes and elephants to the health of the forest, and, and they still didn't get it. Most of the population still think apes are nice because when you put clothes on them, they're funny. They look a bit like us. We have got to bring the wider population up to understand that protecting apes and elephants isn't just because they're cute or they're intelligent or they share some DNA with us, but because of the role they play in those ecosystems. And the, the point I made to this climate scientist who was saying, this carbon scientist whose job was to measure the carbon in forests, when I spoke about animals, she's thinking there's not much carbon in an animal. They're not that important to my job, even though I personally like them. And I said, look, if you weigh a car, you've got so much steel. If you take the cogs out of the car, you've got very little less steel, but it doesn't work. So animals are not optional extras for forests. They're components of the forest. And that doesn't get through to people. So please, filmmakers, take this message in your documentaries, in your things, that these are not ornaments. They're essential to the health of the forest. And under the UN Climate Convention, we now recognize that these forests are essential to stabilize our climate, to say nothing of rainfall and all of the, the other ecosystem services. So extreme conservation is necessary. I, I applaud what everyone's doing. But it's not just necessary because apes are cute. It's necessary because we're trying to protect those ecosystems and all that they protect. Sorry to get on a rant, but I wanted people to see this in that context, not just because brave people are putting their lives on the line to protect apes. Thank you very much. So this will be rapid fire, 30 seconds. If you could change one thing, what would you do? Let's, we'll work here and we'll, we'll end with you, Damien. Um, corruption, I think, without a shadow of a doubt. If we can get rid of the corruption, we increase transparency, we enable laws and legal systems to function, and if the laws and the legal systems function, 80 to 90% of our work is already done. I'm going to be greedy in two. Ensure uh, enough viable habitat, enough s intact habitat for viable populations of, of apes. And secondly, deal with bushmeat. Apes are so sensitive to even a few individuals being killed that leads to declining populations. I'm also going to be greedy and ask for two, but I think um, Ian has already touched the, the first one. Um, we have to to get good governance. We need, we need the govern governments to assist us. We're doing the the job on the ground, as soon as the poacher leaves the park, um, it's open to corruption and it's really difficult to get those guys convicted. But then the, the main point is the end user. Like, like Martha said, um, we have to work on the end, end user. We have to work on the guys in the east uh, that buys the ivory, that buys the rhino horn, and that's making our work very, very difficult. One thing I, I, I would really change is this meeting. So I, I wouldn't like to have this meeting held every year. I mean, it's it's incredible that that we need to care for 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 great apes because they are in danger. So we we should not have this meeting because they are in danger, but but because they are great and because they are our closest relatives and and because they can make us learn too many things about about us. Okay, so if I could change anything, okay, so the answer probably extends beyond the walls of this room. As a species, we're smart enough to desex our cats and dogs, but we struggle with the ethics of human population. 
Uh, if I could change one thing, it would be to find a way around that. There's five million species on Earth and human beings are one of them. Thank you, panel. Thanks for coming today, everyone. <laughs>